It's time. Hello again, Traveler. My name is Korg the Mighty, here with a nerdy guide to D&D. And here we are, we finally made it. Part three of talking about the D&D lineages. Catching everyone up, this is a series where I go into each lineage's unique traits, as well as some surface level background lore. Today, we'll be talking about two groups of lineages. First, the monstrous ones. These consist mostly of previous enemies in campaigns. Lineages like Ungabunga Orcs, Twilight Cosplayers, and Second are the setting-specific lineages. These lineages were introduced with the release of setting-specific books like Eberron and Spelljammer, adventures that were meant to be contained to specific areas. You can still use these lineages wherever, it's just a good way of organizing things. Also, brief note, part two of the lineages stuff, thank you very much for the support. But as you could probably tell, it was quite long. As a result, it rolled a nat 20 on destroying my sleep schedule, so we're going to make a slight change. If we have covered an ability before, like trance or dark vision, or an ability is pretty stock standard like resistances, we're going to be briefly summarizing those going forward. Finally, as always, when it comes to the background lore of these lineages especially, you don't have to play exactly what I say. Play what makes you happy. You are allowed to choose your own happiness. It is okay. Let's talk about what happens when you cross a bug with a bear. A stealth mission? All right, let's go. So after that fever dream, first up we have the bug bears, whose first line of lore says they are neither bugs nor bears. Oh no. The bugbear is an absolute enigma of a species. Of course, there isn't one definitive meaning to its name, but most kind of agree that the name is meant to refer to a frightening thing or a boogeyman, which actually fits perfectly into the lineage's special traits. Now I want you to take a look at this, right? And I want you to guess what you think its special trait is. Did you guess stealth? If so, who are you? Who hurt you? Yes, D&D bugbears are known for their stealth. They were known in their early days for residing in hidden places within the Feywild. Of course, the Fey had something to do with this. That is until they were unleashed upon the mortal plane by their conquering god, Maglubit. Mom, pass. He's the chief deity of goblinoid creatures, and his picture looks like this on the D&D wiki, which is completely par for the course at this point. So in summation, sent to wreck havoc on the mortal plane by a god that looks like this, they look like this, and they're proficient in stealth. But with all this hype, what are your special traits? First, long-limbed, you got Mr. Fantastic Arms, which give you an additional reach of five feet. Pretty handy. Army, shut up. Second, sneaky. You are proficient in stealth and can move through spaces designated for small creatures. So essentially, bugbears and these big things can fit through spaces for things like gnomes and halflings. They just right through. Third is surprise attack. If you hit a creature before that creature has taken their first turn of combat, you deal an extra 2d6 damage. Again, only before the first turn, but the fact that these things can surprise anyone is a feat to be admired. Standard abilities include Dark Vision, Fey Ancestry, and Powerful Build, the one where you count as one size larger for lifting and carrying things. Hang on, so they can move through small spaces but can also count as a large creature when moving stuff? Final verdict, Watsi, do you like know how matter and physics works? The horse used the elevator. I didn't know he knew how to do that. I can hear the Percy Jackson fans from here. It's time for the centaurs. Stalwart, majestic, horse girls rise up. The centaurs of D&D were said to gallop throughout the multiverse before making their way to the mortal plane. Their top halves more so resembling beautiful elves than humans. And most of their special traits are based on their gifted lower halves. First, just like the satyrs have their horns and the tabaxi have their claws, you have your hooves which can deal 1d6 plus your strength modifier in bludgeoning damage. Second is your charge ability. If you move at least 
30 feet straight towards a target and then hit it with a melee weapon, you can immediately use your bonus action to attack them with your hooves as well. They fucked around, you're just letting them find out. Go on, break their legs. Your standard traits are getting an extra proficiency plus 10 to your normal walking speed and equine build. Equine build is essentially the same as powerful build, with the added bonus that climbing is extra difficult for you. Because, you know, that. Final verdict, my little pony be looking very different though. The only reason I watch my mouth is so I don't get my ass beat. That's it, I'm five foot one, I'm all the way down here, I'm short as hell, what the fuck am I gonna do? Oh look, now all players below five foot four get a lineage that matches their personality and their height. I'm ready to fight. Goblins, nimble, crafty, and recipients of the Oxford Dictionary's 2022 Word of the Year Award. I'm so proud. Before serving the god of gobbledygook over there, the goblin species served the Queen of Air and Darkness, one of the more powerful archfey of the Feywild. In her dangerous domain, goblins learned many tricks to help them take down and survive against foes several sizes larger than them. The first of these traits is Nimble Escape. Typically, to disengage or hide from someone, you need to use your full action. But as a goblin, you can use your bonus action for this thanks to your small size and quick reflexes. The second trait is one I'm expecting to find in the comments after that first short joke, and that is the Fury of the Small. When you damage a creature that is larger than you, you can add damage equal to your proficiency bonus a couple times per day. To wrap it up, your standard abilities are Dark Vision and Fey Ancestry. Short and simple. Final verdict, if you want to fight, come to 920 Waterfield Lane. Once again, taking off my headphones because I constantly forget that they're on my head. Is it me? Am I the drama? I don't think I'm the drama. Maybe I am. Am I the villain? I don't think I'm the villain. Released in 2017 via a book called One Grung Above, you have the Grung. And by God, did I have a different view of them before this video. Before, I just thought they were like some funky frog people, but I have since learned that they are actually extremely territorial and hostile, live in a strict caste system based partially on their skin color, and are apparently always on the lookout for creatures that they can either capture or enslave, viewing themselves as a superior species to everyone around them. I mean, this is peak frog performance, but damn. To give you an idea of how messed up these funky frog dudes are, uh, as their lore says, most of their slaves are fed mildly poisoned food to keep them lethargic and compliant. That a creature affected this way over a long period of time becomes a shell of its former self and can be restored to normalcy only by magic. At least we have the tier list now. Dragon blood, mind flayers, and frog people. Congrats, I guess. The whole poison thing, though, that is their main special trait. Each grung naturally sweats and secretes a substance that is harmless to them, but extremely poisonous to others. This is their poisonous skin. Any creature that touches you must make a roll. If they fail, they are poisoned for one minute, which gives them disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Additionally, you can coat a piercing weapon, like a spear or an arrow, with with this poison. A creature hit by this weapon must roll, and if they fail, they take 2d4 poison damage on top of whatever the normal damage was supposed to be. It's brutal, but we're not done. Thanks to your standing leap trait, you have an automatic long jump of 25 feet and a high jump of 15 feet, with or without a running start. And on top of that, for your standard abilities, you're immune to poison, you can breathe both air and water, you have a climb climbing speed of 25 feet because of the suckers on your hands and feet, and you're proficient in the perception skill. Finally, you do have to immerse yourself in water for at least one hour per day, otherwise you get dried out and exhausted. But if that's the only thing holding you back, oh my god, you can destroy some folks. Final verdict, turtles and frogs, I know what I'm getting Watsy for their birthday. Ugh, I need to feel happy. Aaron, can you tell me something that'll make me happy? You're cute and have a nice butt. Yep, that'll do it. Hobgoblins, generous, valuing teamwork. They're the new Santa Claus. Also serving the god of gobbledygook, taller than goblins, but a bit shorter than bugbears, and primarily known for two 
things. Number one, their noses actually turn bright red or blue during displays of emotions, which I think is adorable. And second is their special trait, which is essentially gift giving. During their time in the Feywild, Hobgoblins adopted the rule of reciprocity, valuing the strong bonds they formed with their friends and family, and actually being able to draw strength from those bonds. Their first special trait is Fey Gift. Typically, the help action is something that your character can do to give another character advantage on their next ability check. In the theater of the mind, it's like your character is helping another character towards something, meaning they're more than likely going to succeed. With Fey Gift, you can use the help action as a bonus action a couple times per day, and at level 3, that help action gains an extra ability. These extra abilities can range from gaining temporary health to bonus movement speed, and even giving hostile creatures disadvantage on their attack rolls. But the good times don't stop there, as you also have Fortune of the Many. Essentially, if you fail an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can apply a bonus to that roll, equal to the number of allies that you can see within 30 feet of you, up to a maximum of three. A free plus three ain't bad. And then for your standard stuff, you got some dark vision and some fey ancestry. Yeah, hobgoblins, nice, wholesome, kinda help elevate the party. Final verdict, one of them better be Rudolph in my next Christmas play. <laughs> Cobalt, otherwise known as the Nintendo DS to the Dragonborn's Nintendo Switch. Cobalt's are pretty simple to explain, especially since we've already covered the Dragonborn. Just like how many of a Dragonborn's traits are determined by the dragon that they come from, so too are the Cobalt's. That being said, instead of getting a badass breath weapon, your Draconic Ancestry, or here it's called Cobalt Legacy, will give you things like extra proficiencies, saving throw advantages, and spells. Pretty Pretty basic stuff depending on which path you choose. Where kobolds stand out is their draconic cry. As a bonus section, you can just start screaming. But unlike the screaming on Reddit forums, this will have actual results, as you and your party will now have advantage on attacking anyone within 10 feet that can hear you, at least until the start of your next turn. And finally, why not throw a dark vision in there? Final verdict, the kobolds and goblins steal kneecaps, much like Matt Mercer steals my heart. Banana. Nom, nom, nom. Nom, nom. The lizard folk, durable, mysterious, and always looking for the buffet. Their special trait? Om nom nom. Unlike a lot of lineages we've covered, the lizard folk actually started on the mortal or material plane. Because they're very mystical and have been around for so freaking long, there are myths that the lizard folk were actually placed here by the gods themselves to protect the material plane's natural wonders. But instead of doing that, they just go around biting shit. If centaurs got their hooves, you've got your bite. Deals the same damage, a 1d6, but it's slashing damage this time. I thought it'd be piercing damage. Who slashes with their teeth? Just <gasps> taking it a step further, you also have your hungry jaws. A couple of times per day, you can throw yourself into a freeding frenzy, whereby you can attack as a bonus action with your bite. But every time that sucker connects, you also gain some temporary hit points. That's right, you can heal yourself by biting other people. Unbelievable, I'm going to go try this immediately. Beyond that, your standard abilities are that you have a swim speed, you can hold your breath for up to 15 minutes, and you got some natural armor like the Lokatha. Final verdict, they should have a climbing speed so that they can scale up things. Scale, I already used that pun in part one. <clears throat> is, there a, is there a Mrs. Coming. Sunbreaker or, or? Are you flirting with the fucking Minotaur? He is fucking hot. <laughs> <laughs> If you thought a centaur's charge was scary, oh boy, let me throw on a set of horns and five toxic Jimbros worth of unnecessary toxic masculinity. These are the Minotaurs. Barrel-chested humanoids with apparently an impressive sense of direction for some reason. While some lineages have poison glands and weird magic stuff, all you need are the horns on your head. First, there are the horns themselves, 1d6 plus your strength modifier in piercing damage. Let's crank it up a notch with Goring Rush. If you move 20 feet with the dash action, you can use your horns as a bonus action attack. Very similar to a centaur's charge, but you know what a centaur doesn't have? Hammering 
horns. Every time you hit a creature with a melee attack, you can use your bonus action to push them with your horns. If they fail their saving throw, they are pushed 10 feet away from you into whatever, into a pit, a lake of fire, an uncomfortable conversation with their ex. It's scary stuff. Finally, your standard abilities are having advantage on survival checks to navigate or track, and you always know which direction's north. Remember me pointing out that whole navigation thing before? Final verdict, this is the only lineage that can't do anything about its rampant horniness. Are we supposed to know what we're doing? No? Great. Just checking. Orcs. Large. Tanky. Surprisingly fast. Like, these are some speedy freight trains right now. Orcs were originally created by their god, the One-Eyed Groomsh who looks like a real-life version of the angry emoji. They were created to serve as defenders against extraplanar threats, using their durability and tenacity to honor the one that created them. We don't have to spend much time on the orcs, as most of their abilities were already covered by the half-orcs. They got dark vision, powerful build, relentless endurance. Their one difference is adrenaline rush, where they can dash as a bonus action. Dashing momentarily doubles your movement speed and is typically a full action. You also gain temporary hit points every time you dash, bonus action or not. And that's the lineage. Big, tough, gonna hit you in the head with a club. Final verdict, I wish it was the Warhammer 40k orcs. That would be nuts. So where's this dog I keep hearing so much about? Oh, he's right here. That's a grown ass man. Yeah. Oh, this is a cool one. It's the shifters, baby. Every shifter comes with a free case of partial lycanthropy, giving all of them a somewhat bestial appearance depending on their animal ancestor. They are often called wear touched and use their ancestry to transform into powerful animal hybrids that really freak out some onlookers. As a shifter, your special trait is predictably shifting. A certain number of times per day, you can use your bonus action to shift giving yourself a more bestial appearance and some temporary hit points. However, there are different types of shifters, each getting a different buff when they shift. Beast hide shifters get even more temporary hit points, a plus one to their AC, and adopt a form similar to a werebear or werebore, so lots of fur and you get real big. Long tooth shifters, however, being descendant from werewolves, are much more aggressive, donning a set of long fangs that they can use to bite. Here's the thing, their bite does piercing damage. I'm looking at you, lizard folk. Swift strides shifters, you got were tigers and were rats. Fast. You get an extra 10 feet of movement, and if a creature ends its turn of combat within 5 feet of you, you can use your reaction to move 10 feet away without triggering extra opportunity attacks. Finally, Wild Hunt Shifters. These are more dog-like, so instead of fangs, you get advantage on wisdom checks and nobody can attack you with advantage. That can be pretty life-saving. Last but not least, all shifters get dark vision and proficiency in an extra skill. Final verdict. I'm rocking with this alternative ending to Brother Bear. There's no need to be afraid of me. I don't bite. Yeah, but do you stab? I don't bite. With the last of the monstrous lineages, we have the Huan Ti. Snake people. It's snake people. They're immune to poison, they have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects, cause like mystical snake stuff. They got some extra spells like poison spray, animal friendship, and suggestion, and they got dark vision. Overall, there isn't much that makes them stand out, which kind of sucks because they're snake people. You give skin that secretes poison to the frogs, but barely anything to the snake people. There's actually one similarity between the Grung and the Yuan Ti, weirdly enough, and it's the caste system. Yeah, the more snake like a Yuan Ti is, the higher their place in the system. Final verdict you could have at least given them proficiency in history for the meme, guys. For the meme. All right, let's get right into those setting specific ones, starting with gnomes squared. Is this turning into maybe a near-death experience? Possibly. Does this add to the adventure? Absolutely. Released in December of 2022, the Kender are a very new lineage that essentially take the over-the-top curiosity and fun-loving nature of gnomes and crank that shit to 30. Upon their creation, the Kender were transfused with a huge unbridled source of magic that left them with a supernaturally influenced sense of discovery and fearlessness. To give an example, it is a completely normal occurrence for the Kender to just 
fall into portals that transport them to other planes and worlds, and they're just like, oh wow, what does that flower do over there? Your first special trait is fearlessness, which means you have advantage when rolling to avoid being frightened or end being frightened. Not only that, but once per day, if you fail one of those rolls, you can just succeed. And not like in the halfling way where you have to re-roll the dice and then take that number. No, you can just say, nope, I succeeded and that's that. Would have been real helpful to have that in middle school, but hey, here we are. Your other special trait is taunt, which probably functions how you think. You start saying things like skill issue and no maidens, causing everyone to roll. If they fail that roll, they have disadvantage on attacking anyone other than you. Finally, for standard abilities, you get some extra proficiencies, but no dark vision. Hey, Watsy, I, I can enjoy a curveball every now and then. Final verdict, give them some espresso. That definitely won't have multiverse altering consequences. This is a dream that I have had since lunch and I am not giving up on it now. See, a long time ago, there were some humans. They made contact with some rogue spirits called Quarry from the Plane of Dreams. Things got a bit intimate and pop, the Kalashtar were born. Kalashtar are seen as a wise and spiritual people with a great compassion for others who are simultaneously constantly haunted by the conflicts of the otherworldly spirits that they are connected to. As such, most of their traits are due to their connection to the dream plane. For pretty standard abilities, you've got resistance to psychic damage, advantage on all wisdom saving throws, and you're immune to magical spells and effects that require you to dream. See, Kalashtar don't really dream like the rest of us, instead drawing on the memories of otherworldly spirits, meaning spells like dream just don't really work on them. Finally, their primary special trait is Mind Link. This allows you to speak telepathically to one creature and allow one creature at a time to telepathically speak back to you. Final verdict, see this is where telepathy makes sense. Baby, I would do anything for you. Really? I want you to eat three meals a day and hold a regular sleep schedule. Anything else? Hey, you remember those Mark sublineages from part one? Did you know that there was a multi-century war fought over them? Cause I sure didn't. 2,500 years ago, the Mark of Making first started appearing on people, causing a big war to break out. The war eventually ended, and one of the big winners was a group called House Kanith. Years went by, and things were good, until something called the Last War started. Something about a king dying, and a bunch of people trying to vie for the throne, like, you know, Game of Thrones style stuff. But House Kanith was like, oh, we've done really, really good these past couple centuries, we should get in on this. And you know what we should use to fight? Robots. See, House Kanath already had a bunch of automated robots that mostly did manual labor, but they weren't exactly geared for fighting. They were like, oh, what if we soup them up with some magic, make them a real threat? At which point they accidentally made them sentient. I don't know how you do that, but they did, and now we have the Warforged. The Warforged are machines that were literally forged for war, now having to make their way in a world that is strange and new to them. But they have some cool abilities to help with that. First, with Sentry's Rest, you don't have to sleep, like at all. You need to spend six hours in mobile, but you're awake the entire time, making you the perfect watchtower for a sleeping party. Second, with Integrated Protection, you get a plus one to your AC. However, any armor you put on takes an hour to do so because you actually have to screw and weld it onto your body. You can't just put it on. And finally, constructed resilience, which gives you so much stuff. Running it down, you get advantage on saving throws against being poisoned. You have resistance to poison damage. You're immune to diseases. Magic can't put you to sleep and you don't need to eat, drink, or even breathe. And you also get an extra skill and tool proficiency because why not? Final verdict. All hail the AI overlords. Don't beat yourself up over past mistakes. You are going to fuck up again in the future. Elephant dudes, peaceful, calm, chill, and just the best to hug. Your special trait is being an elephant dude. Like that's all and that's all it needs to be, bro. You got powerful build, you got natural armor, you have advantage against being charmed or frightened, 
and you get a bonus to rolls when trying to smell things. Delightful. Your main special trait, having a dope ass trunk. This thing doesn't have any super show stopping abilities. The entire thing with Loxodons is that they move through life slowly and don't get into many fights. Imagine if you had a trunk, what would you do with that? and then just do it in the game. Easy peasy, beholder squeezy, it will catch on. As the Loxodon often say, there are three things all wise men fear. The sea in a storm, a night with no moon, and the anger of a gentle man. Final verdict, they will curb stomp you if you try them too much. Not in love. You may think you are, you dumb fuck, but you're not. Yeah, well, how do you know the difference? She's half chicken. <laughs> So you know how shifters have that connection to their animal ancestors? Well, what if instead of that, you wrangled the power of the wild yourself? Introducing the Simic hybrids. While the traits of most lineages were given to them by the gods or were produced through natural evolution, the Simic hybrids are anything but natural. See, to Simic hybrids, normal humanoids are weak and primitive, and it is only through magically manipulating and transforming the body that one can truly call themselves superior. Each hybrid is a fusion of different life forms created by a group called the Simic Combine in an effort known as the Guardian Project, which seeks to produce an army of magical super soldiers. Hybrids are crafted with the intent of being able to perfectly adapt to a variety of combat situations thanks to their special trait, their animal enhancements. At level 1 and level 5, you can choose a new bodily element to add on to your character, and these can range from things like manta ray wings that reduce fall damage, extra appendages that can grapple and beat down other foes, and specialized glands that allow you to spit acid at people. For their standard abilities, they only have dark vision, but the sheer customizability that their main trade offers can lead to some interesting combinations. Final verdict, these people built like Legos. You just keep adding on to them. I'm stronger, I'm smarter, I'm better. I am better! The Vidalkin, a partially amphibious lineage that actually has some stuff in common with the Simic hybrids from a cultural perspective. Much like the hybrids, the Vidalkin are driven by their idea of perfection. However, instead of achieving this through improvement of the body, they achieve it through improvement of the mind, immersing themselves heavily in topics like history, medicine, and pickpocketing for some reason. This is where their main trait comes into play called tireless precision. Lord, they're speaking my language. Like most standard abilities, it gives you an extra skill and tool proficiency. However, when using that skill or tool, you can also add a 1d4 to that roll. So it just makes you extra, extra good at a couple things. Beyond that, you also have advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws, and you can breathe underwater for up to an hour, specifically by absorbing oxygen through your skin. Final verse. Verdict, I guess the Vidalcan are just one big nose. Look, Simba, everything the light touches is our kingdom. Hailing from the golden plains of Orescos, we have the Lion King 3 Get Good Edition. In their lore, Leonin are hardly known to interact with outsiders, spending most of their lives guarding their homeland, which is a place that some gods won't even trespass on. To defend this place, you're going to need some special traits, starting right off the bat with guttural screaming. A Leonin's daunting roar trait actually works exactly like the Cobalt's crying ability, except instead of getting advantage, on attacking enemies, you make enemies frightened of you. Beyond that, your standard abilities are your claws and extra skill proficiency and da 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 dark vision. And that's it. They're very simple, but if you want to roleplay as a lion person biting people's heads off or making a butcher shop real awkward, there's one lineage to go with. Final verdict. So are they like related to the tabaxi or something? Because like lions are cats too. The universe! It's me! Our last six lineages for today all come from the Spelljammer expansion released in August of 2022. The main shtick of this expansion was D&D in space. First, we have the Astral Elves. Essentially, way back when most of the elves were living in the Feywild, a group of them just went, hey, that Astral Plane. 
You want to live there? Sure. And because nothing apparently ages in the astral plane, each astral health is typically very, very old, like hundreds on hundreds of years old. This longevity has actually desensitized their population to many things. A lot are just constantly depressed or don't have any feelings whatsoever as they view everything as having very little meaning. As an elf variant, you have their standard abilities, dark vision, fey ancestry, keen vision, and an extra cantrip. You also have trance, but it's called astral trance, which I think involves LSD, but don't quote me on that. It's like normal trance, but by drawing from shared elven memories and the experiences of entities on the astral plane, you can also gain one skill and one weapon proficiency every time you do it. They don't stack, but still pretty useful. Finally, there's your starlight step, which is exactly like the Eladrin and Shatter Kai where you can teleport, but without the extra cool abilities. Final verdict, there's a star man and he's got very long ears. It's <laughs> so cute. Are you shitting me? Capitalism really popped off today, ladies. If I had a nickel for every time a species created a sentient mechanical lineage, I'd have two nickels which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. So remember when we talked about the rock gnomes in part one? They were like the techie gnomes making robots and stuff. Well, come 2022, Watsi decided to reveal that the rock gnomes were so good at tinkering that they created robotic life. Enter the auto gnomes. Get in the zone. Autonomes. A unique part about autonomes is that canonically everyone is supposed to be different. Each autonome has a different rock gnome creator that would customize them in any number of ways. And just like the Warforged, they have a metric ton of traits. Starting with the standard ones, you have that sentry's rest where you don't have to sleep, as well as two tool proficiencies, armored casing, which is essentially just stronger natural armor, resistance to poison, immunity to diseases, advantage on saving throws against being paralyzed or poisoned, you don't need to eat, drink, or breathe, and people can heal you with the mending spell. I think I forgot to breathe there for a second too. But the best one by far is built for success, where you can just Add a d4 to one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Just instant auto bonus. Of course, you can only do it a couple times per day. Final verdict, Gladys would be overpowered as a D&D &D character. Hi, I'm Derek Bum. Say goodbye to daily stains and dirty surfaces with new kitchen gun. Space hippos! What do you think their abilities are, huh? I mean, elephant people got trunks. Lion people got roaring hippos. What, they got a big king of a body? Well, yes, but they also have guns. With firearms mastery, you have proficiency with all firearms. Ignore the loading property of any firearm, and attacking at long range with a firearm doesn't give you disadvantage. Who the f gave Gloria a Glock spaces nuts? In the description for this trade, it actually says, you have a mystical connection to firearms, which is the most American thing I've ever heard, that traces back to the gods of the gift who delighted in such weapons. Who are their gods, Smith and Wesson? It gets even more ridiculous when you find out that the GIF don't actually know who the gods are that created them, and they even don't know where their home planet is. They just roam the multiverse, shooting things up and getting in debates on how their name is pronounced. But your gun skills aren't all you have, as you also have the trait Astral Spark. A couple of times per day, you can psychically access a reservoir of divine power and channel that into an attack, dealing extra force damage. And finally, you have advantage on strength-based ability checks and strength saving throws, because girth. So to summarize, Psychic Hippo Gunslingers from Space. Draw your own final verdict on that one. Parkour! It's time for the flying monkeys. I can see some flying monkeys is zooming around my head right now. The Hadozi are small simian-like creatures that were constantly hunted by predators in their early days. To avoid them, they started making their homes in the tops of trees, eventually evolving wing-like flaps that enabled them to glide from branch to branch. Eager to leave their hostile plane behind, they took to traveling between the planes to establish a safer life for themselves. In terms of your special traits, the first two are probably what you imagine from looking at this. First, you can glide, reducing the damage of a fall to zero as long as there is room. Second, you got hands for feet, and you can do whatever you want with those. 
pick up small objects, eat food, and start a very unique Feet Finder account. Finally, there's your Hadozi Resilience, where you can channel magic through your veins to heighten your natural defenses. Essentially, it's like the Goliath Stone's Endurance, but a little bit weaker, but you can use it multiple times per day. Final verdict, Wicked Witch, come pick up your kids. There's a spider. So what you want me to do? Kill it! You saw it first! You killed it! You're the man! Since when? Excuse me, do you want some bugs in space? Well, here are some bugs in space! With our second to last lineage, we have the Thrykeen. There's not much in the way of lore that I could find. They just seem to be bugs in space. But what they lack in an explanation, they make up for in traits. For starters, your Chameleon Carapace gives a boost to your AC, and you can change the color for extra stealth, or just so that you're matching your bug boots. You got Dark Vision, you also don't have to sleep like the Warforged or Auto Gnomes. You can also speak telepathically, which is great, because the Thrykeen don't really speak like the rest of us. They apparently communicate by clacking their mandibles and waving their antenna, which for anybody other than a mime might be difficult to interpret. Last but not least, you have a set of secondary arms which can be used like normal arms, even to carry light weapons. Final verdict, the Tyranids are still probably gonna start a lawsuit if they knew what that was. It was perfect, perfect, everything, down to the last minute detail. And finally, we are here, the final lineage that we'll be talking about today, and it is none other than the glorious, harrowing, mystical, wet, slimy, globulous plasmoids, by far the best lineage in all of D&D. Are they the strongest? No. Are they the most intelligent? No. Are they the most blobby? Yes and that is why they are the best. To be a plasmoid is to be more than just a lineage. To be a plasmoid is to embrace form and see the beauty in formlessness. As a plasmoid, you are blob. You do blobby things. You can wiggle your way into the tiniest of spaces that bugbears can only dream about. People do not grab you. You merely allow them to touch your amazingly putrid expanse. To make humanoids better, you can assume a form similar to them, changing your form however you like. You have a pseudopod, and I definitely knew what that word meant before writing this script. Uh, Wikipedia says it is a temporary arm-like projection. So you have a space tentacle. And finally, these glorious creatures have resistance to acid and poison damage and advantage on saving throws against being poisoned. Miraculous. Final verdict, I knew it was a good idea to get my degree in slimeology. That draws us to a close. Truly, this was a wild ride for me to go on. I maybe knew 40% of all the info that I provided across this journey, so I got to learn a ton, and hopefully you did too. There are still some lineages in the wings, but these were the main ones that I wanted to talk about for now. Maybe we'll do some more episodes on this in the future, but for right now, I need to go pass out. I hope you all enjoyed. As always, have a fantastic night. This is Korg the Mighty signing off.